Hello, and uh, welcome everyone. My name is Kamal Munir, and I'm privileged to be moderating a very important conversation tonight on Black Lives Matter, Has Anything Really Changed? Last year, triggered by the violent deaths of African Americans at the hands of the police, the slogan Black Lives Matter gained significant traction. It reached fever pitch after the brutal killing of George Floyd, especially. Here in the UK, many came out on the streets to express their anger at the persistent persecution of and discrimination against black people. They organized to protest not just police brutality, but also instances of systemic racism that prevented black people from achieving their potential in society. As someone who studies business and organizations personally, I've never seen so many corporations under pressure to look inwards and explain why so little diversity existed in their top echelons. New diversity initiatives started as a result and PR departments got busy churning out statements in support of diversity. A year on, it seems like a good time to ask if anything has really changed. And to discuss this, we have a stellar panel with us today. But before I introduce uh, the panel, a word about how to ask questions. You're all watching it on YouTube. And if you have any questions, use the code under the video. The code is A093. Use it for questions for the panelists. So on my panel today, Kainde Andrews is a professor of Black Studies at Birmingham City University. He has several books to his name. The latest published this year is The New Age of Empire, How Racism and Colonialism Still Rule the World. Kainde is co-chair of the Black Studies Association. Then we have Dr. Monica moreno Fagorova, who's associate professor in sociology at Cambridge where she also has the role of university race equality champion. She co-leads the Decolonize Sociology Committee and runs the End Everyday Racism Project that monitors racism in higher education. And we have Dr. Ali Megji, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology as well at Cambridge. He's also co-chair of the department's Decolonizing Sociology Committee and has published various books, including Critical Race Theory, a Reintroduction and Decolonizing Sociology. Dr. Pragya Agarwal is a behavioral scientist, author, and consultant. Pragya is the author of several books, including Sway, Unraveling Unconscious Bias, and speaks regularly on bias, anti-racism, social inclusion, power, and privilege. So delighted to welcome you all on a day that number 10 has announced that Britain doesn't really have the problem of institutional racism. So not sure what we are all doing here, but let us pretend that there is a problem out there and BLM was trying to actually change something. Has it succeeded? Try to answer very briefly, please. Certainly no more than five minutes so that we can follow up with questions. And would be great if you can start out with a yes or no to the question before elaborating. Before you respond, however, since we are on the topic of whether everything, anything has changed, I want to proudly point out one thing that has, seems to have changed. At my college, Homerton, we appointed a new principal today, Simon Woolley, who becomes the first male black head of a college in 800 years of Oxbridge. So very excited about that, but back to my question. Has anything changed? Shall we start with you, Kainde? Uh, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for, for being here. Uh, yes, apparently everything's changed. I, I, I just found out today that there is no institutional racism. Uh, the real problem is what poor white people, and we just need to move on. Like, I, I, I'm happy. Look, we're here. So I guess we can end, the, we can end this conversation. But um, <laughs> I mean, I guess less than glibly, what has, something has changed, and this has not changed for the better. In fact, it's changed for the worse uh, and, and quite significantly. And I think this report is the perfect example of that. So what happened over the summer is it was a moment. OK, I wasn't optimistic because I never get optimistic just to, um, as an as a, as a, as a ontological point. Um, but there was a moment of um, optimism. It was re like a real focus. There were different discussions about race and ethnicity. As you said, there was, you know, I got invited to talk to all these massive companies about race for the first time. It's like, oh, okay, so maybe it's a bit different. Uh, there was a run on books, all the uh, anti-racist books were sold out on Amazon. So there was, like, there was a, certainly a different level of conversation, but that's done. I mean, that's, that has gone. And in fact, why I say it's got worse is because the backlash to that has been swift and it, we're now actually in a worse position 
on this issue than we were prior to the um, to the eruption and protests in the first place, because the backlash has been severe. I mean, it was very quickly that we weren't talking about defunding the police anymore. We were talking about whether rural Britannia should be sung at the proms. Like, we just got into this culture war debate so, 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 so quickly. And this government is the most diverse government in, 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 in history, is also the most racist government in my, in my, in my, in my, in my certainly in my history. And those two things aren't, aren't coincidental. And what's happened and what's really been the kind of the big, the, the really only big change you've had uh, structurally in terms of race is that there were concessions made so that there are now, there is now some more representation in the professional middle. I mean, look how many of us are here, right? Like professors of this, that, that. Go back 20 years, forget about it. In fact, now it's pretty unlikely, but 20 years ago, completely not, wouldn't have happened. So there's, for some of, some of us have managed to get into positions and there's more influence and we have a diverse government, et cetera. Um, but that was a real bad strategy, thinking about trying to get change. And also, you see, that doesn't actually mean that anything's changed. And in fact, what's happening now, particularly with this government and this report, is that those black and brown faces in those high places um, are now actually being used to legitimize uh, racist policy. Like this, this report is a is as part of the government's wider agenda of saying there's no racism, and they've now went and got some um, institutional racist institutional racism deniers um, to now say to now deny there's institutional racism. And the way it's being reported, I had to correct the two times I was on TV today. Landmark report shows that there's no institutional racism in Britain. I mean, that is frankly ridiculous. This is a report put together by people who have no credibility, background. Uh, even the, and, and if you look at the report, it's so badly done. Um, but that this just shows you the purpose of it is actually to support this really right wing racist agenda from the government. And that is new in the UK, at least having having black and brown faces being so important. In it. It's not new generally. In fact, Empire always needed black and brown faces. There were more Indians in the, in, in the British army than there were British people. Right. Maintaining colonialism in India. Um, so that's not a new feature, but it is a new feature at the moment that we're in now. And I think a particularly insidious one. And I just wanted to pick out one quote from the report. This is how bad it was. This is more of this about the report. But one of the recommendations is that we need to use data in a responsible and informed way uh, to make sure that it, uh, to, make, to reduce the opportunity for misunderstanding and, and, and misuse. Which I just found hilarious given the way the data has been misused and abused and, and the distorted beyond all, 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 all I mean, relevance. But that is unfortunately the moment that we're in when we, we're now in a position where was again having to justify whether racism exists. At least, I don't know, 20 years ago, if you, look, if you compare to the McPherson report, there was just the acceptation, exception that there was institutional racism. And actually now we've gone backwards. So actually I think things have changed and they got worse. Wow. Thanks, Kainde. Uh Yeah, that's quite stark. Um, let's come to you, Ali. And, and what do you think? I mean, because uh, Kainde has raised all kinds of questions. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm thinking, where does the movement stand today? And, uh, you know, what were the actual goals? Uh, all movements have some goals. But anyway, so over to you. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably going to add to Kahindi's <clears throat> pessimism to the extent of I think that if things have changed, they probably have changed for the worse. So, um, but before I go into that, I will just do at least like one minute of maybe some kind of positivity that we can take out of this. So what we did see after the murder of George Floyd was that there were anti-racist protests, not just in the US, not just in the UK, but across the whole world, right? Um, and what you saw in those were that, you know, demonstrations in France connected Floyd's death with their own state violence against post-colonial citizens, Protesters in Kenya connected it to their own problem with police brutality, legitimized through the Public Order Act, which was actually created by the British colonial government. Portuguese protesters carried cards saying racism is colonial heritage. Indigenous groups in New Zealand drew parallels between police violence in the States with hyper-incarceration of the Maori people. And in Belgium, South Africa, and, and Britain, and, and elsewhere, you see statues of colonial figures such as Edward Colston, Cecil Rose, and King Leopold II all being brought down, right? So to an extent, we can see how this murder of George Floyd acted as a catalyst for potential coalitions to be built between many different anti-racist, anti-imperial movements across the world. Um, and really importantly, all of these movements saw the interconnections between what they were struggling against. So for them, racism in the US was not just simply racism in the US, but it was seen as a component part of a world order founded on the principles of racism and coloniality. 
So to this extent, the positivity to take is that these movements basically showed a connection with previous anti-racist, anti-colonial movements, those kind of anti-racist movements that Kahindi was speaking about in terms of um, the positive ones, right? Ranging from Du Bois' critique of the global color line, the so-called defining problem of the 20th century, through to you know the more recent emergence of the Zapatistas in Mexico and their um, attempt to create a world in which many worlds fit. These are all kind of um, yeah, groups bound around a practice to basically find those inherent connections between inequalities all across the world in virtue of how they were forged through coloniality and white supremacy. Um, however, the thing that I want to focus on is the kind of pessimistic side, the, the side which shows that things have changed potentially for the worse. And it's because whilst that kind of year of protest in 2020 carrying on into 2021, whilst they showed that there were transnational solidarities, what we've also seen is transnational resistance to the anti-racist movements, right? Um, so this is where I want to reflect on how things haven't really changed that much for the better. So if the world system is dictated by what we would term as the colonial matrix of power or white supremacy or whatever, then we have to realize that because it's such a totalizing structure, it has the ability to both absorb critique and also insulate itself from change. Um, and while, you know, in my own work, I do think about this in a global way, I think we can just use examples at a national level to think about this dual process of absorbing and insulating from critique and how that becomes articulated in particular, particular national structures. So in the US, for instance, it wasn't that long after the protests began that you got this much wider attack at a governmental level on critical theorizing around race. So for example, Donald Trump in one of his executive orders banned the teaching of critical race theory in public institutions, right? And he also see, saw death threats to those who were willing to speak out against this attack on free speech, such as those that we're seeing recently with Boehner Hesse. Um, and in the UK, you see something really similar. The protests were themselves used to justify a series of measures, all of which effectively insulated the state from any kind of critique. Um, this involved a range of mechanisms from Boris Johnson whipping up a culture war that Kahindi referenced in, in claiming that Britons needed to stop their wet self-recrimination um, and uh, start adopting a positive view towards Britain's past. We have the equalities minister, Kimmy Badenoch, claiming that the government stands unequivocally against the teaching of critical race theory, labeling Black Lives Matter protest protesters as militant Marxists. Liz Truss came up with a leveling up agenda in which she claimed that we need to move away from the fashionable topic of race when we're thinking about social policy. And the culture minister, Oliver Dowden, created a summit um, with large heritage bodies to protect Britain's past from critical investigation. So in other words, what we've seen is essentially that the state took these protests um, against something that happened in Minneapolis and used it as a justification to further legitimize the very social forces which those in Britain and elsewhere were struggling against. Um, and you see that also, for example, in measures to actually further restrict the ability to even protest in the first place under Priti Patel's new legislation. Um, so this is how to come back to also what Kahindi was referring to. This is how we've got to a stage where today we're told there's no evidence of institutional racism in the UK, despite the fact that, for example, 60% of Bangladeshi young children and 50% of Pakistani and black children are living in poverty in the UK. But apparently there's no institutional racism, right? Young black people are now nine times more likely in the UK to be in youth custody than young white people. But once again, there's no institutional racism, right? There's no evidence of it. Um, so I want to conclude by essentially saying, yes, things have changed to the extent that um, we have seen some kind of engagement with already existing movements which connect struggles transnationally. But yes, they've also changed for the worse to the extent that the backlash has kind of outweighed the, any kind of gains that were made through those solidarities that were formed. Great, great. Thanks, Ali. So both Kainde and you, you know, sort of uh, think this backlash has been severe and, uh, and very, very potent. Uh, Monica, what about you? Do you agree or? <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be, um, well, I mean, we could start by saying, yeah, there is a big back, uh, backlash and it's quite interesting that it's happening precisely today. I mean, these days where the murder of of um, George Floyd is being discussed in the US and where many other examples are coming to us, continue to appear. And I think uh, what, if I start with something like positive that I could say, well, what has changed? 
we could think about a lot of like black female leadership that is coming across indigenous female leadership as well in anti-racist work. I mean, there is, I, I think we could fairly say that the attention to racism and anti-racism that we are seeing all over the world is quite remarkable, like unprecedented in the same, in the level of, of, yeah, we can say the level of attention. However, this, um, as I've seen in my own work in terms of Latin American anti-racism, the turn to racism and anti-racism, uh, what, what allows us to see is that race, the ways that people are understanding racism are quite diverse and that the anti-racism that we're seeing generated in many spaces like this one, I mean, this report today, it's a form of anti-racism. You see, it's, a, it's an example of that kind of anti-racist work that is kind of worse than nothing sometimes, so that it would be better not to actually have come across. Uh, because what we have is a reduction and a manipulation of what racism is, uh, uh, reducing it to uh, attitudes, to behavior, to simply microaggressions, and not understanding that microaggressions are the expression of wider phenomena. You know, as uh, it's very interesting, like what reminding what Sarah Ahmed said when she was discussing institutional racism of how it is not a failure. You know, uh, anti uh, institutional racism is not a failure of institutions. On the contrary, is an orchestrated, positive, organized action that says what we have today: racism does not exist. Is not that important. You know, we don't, we're not going to do this. We're not going to act. We're not going to perceive racism in this particular way or the other. So it's a manipulation, a gaslighting. People are talking about that, a gaslighting of that phenomena. You know, in places um, where, I mean, if we move a little bit outside the UK to other contexts where there are different racial projects, like in Latin America, for example, where there is another understanding of mixture of, um, you know, of where mixture is the basic understanding of race. What we see there is that there is a, an attention emerging. There's a discourse emerging and we can actually see it almost much more um, even naive or fragile, this refusal and this gaslighting and this delegitimation. And even in those contexts, I mean, two days ago, a Salvadorian woman called Victoria Salazar was murdered in the same way by uh, a policeman breaking her neck, you know, kneeling on her in Mexico. And we have the exact same parallel. The issue is that in a context like Mexico, they would be saying, or there are some discussions about a clarity of connecting the two cases and insisting on the gravity of institutional and ra racism throughout policing systems. And at the same time, there would be others that re-victimize, you know, that put the blame on the victim and say, well, where, what was she doing there? Where was she? Which is a parallel of what we're seeing with this report. It is about what he's saying. It is about young black people doing the work themselves, or it's about their families, the ones that are to blame, etc. So I think, these parallels are very interesting and I would be very worried about the anti-racisms that we're seeing flourishing at this time. And I think we should be careful of thinking that just the label anti-racism says something very clear and significant. I think it, it has to be mediated and we need to understand what is behind that. So right, I'll right. ask you there. Okay, thank you. Pragya. Yeah, um, what can I add? I mean, I think there's been a lot said already. Um, so I could I could start with saying yes and no, like everybody else. Um, yes, uh, the the kind of international impact of Black Lives Matter, the protests that happened, um, cannot be dismissed. Yes, it 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 for the first time maybe. It wasn't the first time that we were seeing racism or talking about it, but for the first time, maybe people were willing to have a conversation about other forms of racism, not just the explicit hate crimes or explicit forms of racism that can often be acknowledged. People were willing to talk about more subversive forms of racism as well that is deeply embedded in our society that creates these kind of discriminatory barriers for people. Um, 
in my work, I mean, I've, I saw a willingness from a number of organizations in the last few months to engage with these conversations, to actually look inwards, not just talk about diversity, but more often talk about inclusivity and how they can create more inclusive environments and not just create a kind of a performative thing uh, where they're ticking boxes. Um, Yes, that is happening and that has happened. But of course, as, as everybody has said, there's been a backlash, there's been a resistance because we have to understand that even the work of anti-racism is embedded within our society. We're the dominant narrative and we have to think about who is designing the dominant narrative, who is actually able to create this narrative. Um, and I suppose uh, that has really made it um, uh, people aware or made actually really stark, brought it in stark contrast as to what um, the notion of power and privilege and who holds power in, in this society, about who has the power to create these narratives, who has the power to, to create policies that, um, that show, demonstrate that they're doing the anti-racism work, but it's actually not anti-racism in itself. And so, for instance, the report today, um, it's been really kind of shocking, but not shocking in a way, because a system that's got racism embedded in it, in its processes and it's in, in, in the system itself, when it comes back and says there's no racism, it's kind of a circular narrative fallacy because it's saying the racist system is saying there's no racism. Um, and often that's what happens with a lot of organizations that that I've been working in with as well. Um, also, I think when we talk about institutional racism and systemic racism, uh, what has also become quite uh, important to discuss through Black Lives Matter protest and in the last year is to talk about the interrelationship between individual, interpersonal, systemic and in institutional racism and how they feed off each other and how they perpetuate each other and that we cannot just talk about one or the other. We can't just talk about individual and interpersonal aspects like microaggressions or just institutional and systemic and structural barriers. So I think the notion of power and privilege has, has been really, um, really been brought into focus in the last year, but especially with this report. And what really stood out with me with this report is that they are dismissing any forms of bias or dismissing any forms of um, um, kind of, that we need to look at prejudice. They dismiss the notion of white privilege um, which is really um, not very surprising because there's been a lot of discussion going on, but they're using it to say that actually the white privilege doesn't exist. There's no notion of white privilege, um, but there is a notion of affinity bias, which means that people are more related to, uh, are more likely to relate to people who are like us. So then using the notion of bias, which they're dismissing to actually counter racism, which seems like a really bizarre argument. And for from what I've seen with the report, the notion of confirmation bias has really become, um, has been highlighted because they're just picking up cherry picking facts to support what they actually still believe, already believe in. So as Kahindi says, it's probably one of the most racist comments. And as everybody said, I think this report has really highlighted um, that even though we were talking more about it, nothing much has really changed on the ground. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Pragya. So uh, there are lots of people, hundreds of people who are watching you uh, right now, and I'm sure many of them are thinking, so where's the hope, guys? Um, and, and because, yes, movements are mobilizations, right? But then there are counter mobilizations. And, and so and movements just have to deal with that. Uh, so it doesn't have to end with a backlash. Movements can respond. So where do you see this movement, you know? Uh, how do you assess it? How do you evaluate it? Where is its does it have the capability to actually respond and strengthen? So um, can I come back to you, Kainde, on this? I, you know, I actually think that is one of the positive things about this report, because I think that there's been a lot. If you think about the mobilization in the 60s, 70s, you know, they really do lead to the Race Relations Acts. They lead to um, trying to reform the system. They lead, they lead us to this point, really. And I think previously we had faith in these institutions and maybe something can change uh, but this is so brazenly ridiculous that I think we can see through it and I think actually that's one thing generally if you look at the, the protests um, last year you know this this is a group of young people who've been raised on the dream um, that we can fix reform this system uh, and any evidence that shows that's nonsense has to be a good thing because then it gets us thinking that we have to do something else and so I think actually on this one this I'm actually this is actually probably better in the long run um, than the than the McPherson report, uh, 
because the McPherson report gives you hope that it's being taken serious. And this we can just dash it out and say, no, nah, look, we can't rely on the government. Let's let's do the work that needs to be done. So I, I, that's it. I think it's probably a positive thing for the movement. Right. So let me ask Ali. I mean, so kind of said, you know, maybe people are now realizing or movement members are realizing that something else needs to be done. What is that something else that needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree with Kahindi's optimism that this, this just this report lays bare the fact that, you know, this is not being taken seriously, as, as you said, right, that actually there's a lack of understanding, there's a complete lack of understanding of what it even means to talk about racism. Um, and so it shows that you can't rely on the state to, to be the primary institution that's going to create any positive change. Um, but my pessimism remains uh, to the extent of exactly what we need to do now is similar to what people were saying that we need to do hundreds of years ago, right? Even all the way back to the very creation of race itself. I mean, to think about the protests last year and the way it led to kind of like actual popular discourses around abolition, um, which was quite new and lots of mainstream media outlets. But, you know, the concept of abolition was also talked about by Du Bois at the beginning of the 20th century when he was talking about abolition democracy. So um, it just seems like for me, there's <laughs> just these recurrent conversations um, and these sparks where you think that something might happen. But as I said, they, the, these sparks tend to be absorbed and then the status quo remains. Um, and it comes back to what Kahindi said, you get really slight concessions. So you might get a race relations act like you got in the UK, but that's then coupled with maintaining the racial status quo because let's not forget that each of those race relations acts were followed directly by immigration acts that stopped black and brown people from coming into the UK. So, um, so my pessimism slightly remains, unfortunately. I can, I can see that, Ali, yes. And, and so maybe Monica and uh, Pragya can bring in you know, some, some hope here. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Pragya, do you want to go first? <laughs> um, in terms of optimism, I think um, we have to remain optimistic. Um, because if not optimism, then what actually? Um, I, again, as I said, it is at least this wider discourse happening. I mean, look at us, we're talking about it. And there's more discourse happening in media, um, although we keep talking again and again, and finally it has to come to some action eventually. Um, but yes, I think the more we talk about it, the more discourse happens, the more openness there is about these conversations. Um Maybe, uh, I don't know. I don't know what will change. I mean, it's, it's quite, again, it's very difficult to say how we can really change things. But I have seen a willingness for people to change uh, on an individual level, on an institutional level. Um, and I suppose that little bits can create a momentum. Uh, I suppose we need to think about as a society what, what that would look like even. I mean, I don't think we really know what a post-racial society would look like yet. So we need to maybe have a conversation about what is our idealized vision? What would we like to see happen as well? well. That's, what I'm, that's what I'm trying to you know, ask you guys. You know, what is the goal here of the movement? And what are we trying to achieve? And what will it take to achieve that? So maybe Monica has the answer. Well, what I think it will... I mean, I don't know what it will take generally, but one idea that I think can add to the discussion is that we need to think of new ways of communicating what the issues are. I mean, we're clearly not being listened very well or things are not uh, coming through um, or are being misused. And I think it's, you know, if we take it, you know, with a relaxed, approach that we have a lot of work on and we want to do this work because we're committed to wanting a better society. So I think finding ways in which we can be heard are, is important. I think that passes through reimagining the figure of the activist, of, the, of, our, of ourselves as activists of, or any but academic activists or other um, activists, because I feel it somehow exhausted the figure of the activist. And that has been in some ways co-opted, in some ways mistreated, in some ways misused and or depleted, you know? Somehow we've been using a, a very particular way of entering these debates. And I think that it's an opportunity maybe to refashion it. I don't mean by this that we shouldn't protest or we shouldn't interrupt racism or we shouldn't go out and claim and demand. It's just how can we do it 
you know, what else can we do? What, what we haven't done that we need to try now, even if it's totally scary or totally weird. Something I'm very concerned about is how we have also opened somehow a situation where, where there is a big clash between certain groups or certain environment within activism that has a lot of resentment and I think maybe for a reason, but that resentment seems to be guiding the work or some of the work. And that is encountering a lot of defensiveness. And that is just keeping us stuck. We're just stuck in that thing of, you know, I we're gonna, you know, tell you all the things we're aggravated about. And we have all these other groups telling us we're gonna defend our position, whatever whatever it takes, right? So that I just think is not productive anymore. Mm. You know, okay. I, I feel that we have to not encourage a discourse where we are not willing to engage in finding new ways of doing this work. It's an opportunity, you know, and I see it with, um, at, the, at the same time that I'm exhausted and I'm sometimes completely depleted about doing this work, I'm also thinking, okay, how can we do it better with who we have to be working? Who are the subjects that are going to be leading this in much more productive ways? I mean, where are we getting stuck? And we just need to try out things we haven't tried before, which we, we are Thanks. set to imagine. Yeah. Thanks, Monica. Uh, Pragya, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add, and I think that's a really good point uh, that Monica has made about the nature of activism and how that has been maybe co-opted, or maybe we need to reconsider and re-examine how advocacy is sometimes mistaken for activism as well. Um, and that that is kind of the boundaries have been blurred. But I wanted to just say that maybe there is a there's a way forward in actually knowing more about the science and theory of race and racism, which I think that people sometimes don't understand um, I think there is a misunderstanding or maybe a misconception or a, ignorance about how racism really manifests or why racism is still present. And if we look back and think about how race actually started, unless we understand why race came about and how race came about, how the notion of race was constructed and how racism has then progressed or has, has been used by people, um, maybe perhaps that is a way forward as well, maybe more discussion and discourse about it. But also I think the notion of intersectionality can be used to create these kind of non-judgmental discourses where there is less defensiveness. So even when we talk about privilege or even when we talk about bias, if we talk in terms of intersectionality that actually everybody's biased, everybody has privilege, but it's different levels of different kinds of privilege, and that determines your status and position in, in the society and hierarchy, maybe that can be a way forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Pragya. So Monica, you know, talked about we are stuck, we are exhausted. Uh, Pragya sort of, you know, I mean, is telling us that we need a better understanding. So kind of what, what is the way forward here? Right? How do we get out of this, you know, place where we seem to be stuck and we are tired and you know, so because movements need to understand things better obviously but they also need to have a strategy right what does that strategy need to look like i mean the key thing is to stop stop expecting things from the state i mean honestly i'm not frustrated or upset at all i'm actually kind of finding it quite funny i mean it's so bad it's amusing i never expected anything different and what else would you would you want and i think this is a reminder that we just need to stop expecting things from the institutions and start to build our own institutions. I think if you look at the UK, the British Black Power Movement, historically was about the schools don't work, so we're going to do Saturday school. We need employment, so we'll create employment. Um, and there was this moment where because we thought we could get into the system and fix the system, we kind of took our eye off that grassroots organisation. That's always been, this system is against us. The system is deeply racist and there's no solution to racism within the system. So what we should do is, is, is build alternatives. Remember, that this, this is... There is other ways to organize the world. Like it doesn't have to be this way. And so really what we should be thinking about is how do we make the global connections necessary to build alternatives to a system that's not going to get us anywhere. Whether that is Latin America, that is Africa, whether it is UK or Europe. That's what we should be doing. And again, hopefully, this is just a really good reminder that that's, that's the task we should be doing. What, is, what does that alternative look like? Um, you know, and are there any precedents that um, the movement can actually learn from? But yeah, I mean, I think this is, again, like 50 years ago, if I was here saying we need revolution, global revolution, the black revolution, 
that's a real thing. Like that was a that was a thing. Like it wasn't that long ago that they wasn't sure the West would survive. So you have Pan African movements, you have um, certainly Pan Latin American movements. There were there were movements around. This they would have saw people were killed off, bought off, etc. There's lots of precedent to that. Um, and then that's that's where we should go back. Essentially, you asked me a simple answer: is let's go back to that time and try to rebuild those movements. And if we do that in 50 years, we'll be in a very very different place. Okay, Ali, do you want to add anything to what Candy just said? Um, maybe just a sentence or two, because I think I agree with it. And and that's where the positivity did come from in terms of the protests was that that there was a hint that we were trying to at least engage, if not return to some of those earlier traditions, right? Um, and I, I guess just one sentence I want to add is um, that that line from Bob Marley when he's talking about, you know, the end of anti race the, the aim of anti-racism is to make someone's skin color not matter more than the color of their eyes, right? So actually what we need to really engage with is, is the abolition of race, uh, you know, uh, making race not matter anymore in social realities because it was a thing that was made, right? So now we need to get rid of it. So what would the world look like? It's like what Kahindi said, it would be a completely different place because many of our taken for granted categories of existence would no longer even exist, let alone all of the political economies that have been built around it. Right. Um, so we have, we have questions coming in. And since we have you know, so many people, I think uh, we should take, try to answer as many questions as, uh, as possible. And some of these are along the lines of what we are, uh, what we are discussing. Because like one person is asking, you know, I'm so tired of fighting racism. What still gives you hope? So you guys are talking about, you know, this, uh, this alternate and, uh, but are we any closer to that? I mean, what does, again, I come back to my original question, what does the movement need to do in order to get uh, closer to that? So maybe the, I can start with Monica and, uh, and uh, uh, well, let me come to Monica. Yes, Monica. <laughs> well, I think combating these feelings of hopelessness and discouragement is the first thing because that is exactly what oppression does to us it makes us feel that there's no solution that there's nothing we can do that you know we should just give up and i'm not going to give up you know i don't I, that is, is this is the job i want to do and i actually do it with a lot of happiness you know because i am you know one hand at the same time that it breaks my heart every time that i encounter these issues it, it's a really interesting challenge to me. So how can I do it? You know, how can I do it? The same things that I've kind of have taken me to academia, which is, is how do we know what we know? Now I'm really thinking of that question. Okay, so if that doesn't work, what can work? You know, how can it work? And I think one big piece of this whole problem is that from my perspective, we really need to connect dots between I would say what are the emotional effects of oppression in each individual and each collective and the big structural changes and, and challenges. There's somewhere where we get stuck individually and collectively, we get angry, we get upset, we are traumatized, we are furious because somebody's telling us, you know, we, we can't have it our way uh, or we are, believing that advantage and privilege are really good, you know, good for us. And we are just so like, we want to protect it in, in many different ways. So I think there's somewhere there, there's a piece about that where we need to deal with those emotional effects of racism and of oppression in general. What racism does to each person, sexism, classism, all of these form uh, make a way for us to stop fighting, you know, not, well, not only fighting, to stop getting up, to stop thinking again of new things. I want us to think that this is a, an interesting challenge, you know. I'm not saying that it's fun, because it's not necessarily fun in that ha-ha way, but it is interesting to find ways, why are we so stuck when actually racism equally as sexism and environmental catastrophe is not good for anybody, you know? There is a problem here where if we keep understanding racism as something that happens to other and not as this dehumanizing process that confuses us about who we are and who collectivities and other people are, we're just getting stuck. 
you know? So I think we need to kind of, that's what gives me hope, you know, to kind of go back and do those connections between the individual and the structural and think about those, those ways in much more fluid, you know, think about how can I really talk to someone and tell them, you know, someone that supposedly is privileged and say to them, look, have you seen what the, this dehumanizing work has done to you? Do you want that? Is that really, you know? <laughs> so I think, anyway, there are different ways in which we can think about it and, and keeping in mind what racism does. I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to sort of, you know, I mean, um, think through, okay, how we manage to do these things, right? But, but right now I have an interesting question for, for Pragya. And, uh, and this is all uh, Kainde's fault because uh, our questioner is asking, you know, Kainde has asserted that this is the most racist government in recent history. Where is the evidence for that? Um, well, uh, I am an immigrant to this country. I came here 20 years ago, so I haven't really experienced all the governments. But from what history <laughs> tells me, or from what I read from history, is that a partisan politics is on the rise everywhere. I think the notion of fear and mistrust uh, is being used not just in the UK, but everywhere around the world. We are seeing it in India, we've seen it in the US. It's being used by politicians to their own benefit, to their own advantage. And I think the, the, the movement here, the right wing movement, um, and also the way that the government is using the, the notion of race, the notion of gaslighting, the notion of dismissing people's own lived experiences is not very dissimilar to what's happening in India or what's happened in the US as well. Um, I think when the when there is fear and mistrust of people who are outsiders, which is created by um, politicians like people coming in to take your jobs or people changing your lifestyle or people uh, impinging on your own rights and and, and taking up your resources, when that happens, we are more likely to fall back on, 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 on these kind of prejudices that we hold against people. We are more fearful, we are more threatened. And so it's serving their, their, their purpose really by doing that, by dividing these lines. We've seen it in history that uh, we saw it in, during the imperial rule about the divide and rule that happened. And I think it's the kind of same strategy that's been deployed again here mm. of divide and rule. So, um, so that's what I think. Okay, okay. Thanks, thanks, Pragya. Let me bring it back to Kainde because you know he started this, and um, and Kainde. I mean, if we if we believe you that this is you know the most racist government, my question to you would be, why is that so? I would say, I clarify, I say one of the most. I mean, uh, Britain has a lot of racism. It's not like it's not it's not outlier in many ways, and certainly in recent history. Um, but if you actually look at the platform um, of this government. In terms of immigration, in terms of Britishness, in terms of it rhetorically, it's not that dissimilar to the National Front in the seventies. I mean, it really isn't. You could actually take a National Front poster and put it and put it next to these ridiculous flags that all the ministers have when they when they go on TV. And the National Front would never have got into power in, in the seventies. So it's something definitely shifted where these ideas have become mainstream. I think that's a really big thing that's changed where this kind of anti-immigrant rhetoric. And if you look at the this, certainly this is the most anti-immigrant policy this, this, this country has had. And that's building successively on from 60s onwards. And if you look at the Windrush scandal, et cetera, and even look at now, I mean, even the Priti Patel coming out saying, yeah, I would, it, under my own rules, I wouldn't be here. But hey, you know, it's, still, it's still fair, right? I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a certain madness too. But there's been a mainstreaming of really right-wing racist ideas uh, yeah. in a way that, again, 50 years ago, they wouldn't have been mainstream. These would have been really far on the right, honestly. The stuff that they get away with. And one of the ways that, ironically, one of the ways that's possible is because it's the most diverse government in history, right? Preeti Patel says things that white people couldn't say. Let's just be, let's just be 100% honest. You would not have a white home secretary coming out saying um, Black Lives Matter protests were dreadful. Never in a million years. In fact, with this report, no, if this was like David Goodhart, it would have been so much, so much measured and it would have been all subtle and they wouldn't, couldn't have had half of this stuff in it. So one of the things that has happened is because you have this diversity in, in the world, the right particular, it's actually really legitimized just a load of really racist stuff because it's coming out of the faces of black and brown people. Well, so it, it is, the more I think about it, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> We're in a really bad place. That's a very interesting assertion. I mean, Ali, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I completely agree. And it comes back to, um, you know, what Kahindi was actually saying at the very beginning <clears throat> is that it comes down to these concessions. 
right? So um, diversity is a concession that allows for us to maintain the status quo, if not to even take it in, in, into even further extreme directions, right? So we see that now with this most diverse cabinet we've ever had. Um, and the way that like white liberals were all uh, going, what what's the term, gooey-eyed over Rishi Sunak last summer and so on. Um, so so yeah, we see that in the UK. We, we've seen it in the past <clears throat> in the US where you know, one of the big concessions was all of this civil rights legislation that, you know, supposedly desegregated schools, desegregated neighborhoods, desegregated markets and jobs and so on. And yet, as people like Kimberly Crenshaw wrote, 20 years later, stuff's actually worse for us now because all of those affirmative action um, legislation is either used to benefit white people um, or is used to actually justify segregation. So um, it comes back to what Kahindi was saying at the beginning, you know, diversity is a great example of a concession that the state makes in order to just carry on doing what they were already doing. Mm -hmm. right. Monica, what, what's the role? And someone is asking, what is the role that the media has been playing in all this? Because, you know, language has assumed a particular significance with terms like woke and wokery and, uh, and, and, and so forth, you know, mocking, mocking the struggle uh, almost. So do you have any comments on that? Well, what can we say about the media? I mean, it is, it is not a source of like totally reliable information and we need to have, um, we need to understand the positioning of each of the media outlets and, and take our informed view. I mean, we cannot take it as a, a face value, you know? So I guess we know that, but it would be easily to get us, you know, swayed by it and, and think about, um, take it too seriously. You know? I think it's just one more actor that is producing information and that we should just be thinking about ourselves, about what we want to do. I mean, the, the, the recent problems that different media outlets have had, for example, with what happened with uh, the scandal of Harry and Meghan and all this racism going on in the palace and, some people having to resign and, you know, well, it tells us that there, it is a political space, you know, it's a political space. We are seeing it playing out with this report, how the Daily Mail is reporting, saying very welcome report today, whereas other outlets from like, you know, The Guardian or The Independent being more critical about it or, you know, more. Yeah. So I think we just need to be mindful, you know, that they are, carriers of political positions so okay. so okay there's a very interesting question and and so let me know who wants to take this question um and the question is is there a substantial difference in the blm movement in the uk compared to the us if yes how does that show up who wants to go first I'll just go quickly. I mean, yes, certainly BLM in the States is, is you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not just a movement, it's an organization, right? You have it has chapters, it's got funding, it's, it's, it's you know, relatively well organized. Uh, BLM in the UK is more of a movement. Um, it hasn't, there isn't, it isn't like a, what isn't at this point a coordinated organization. Uh, they did get a lot of money recently over the summer. And, but yeah, this would be a good example of how it's different. What they've largely done with their money is, given it to other organizations, whereas Black Lives Matter would have used that as part of their organization. So in a movement terms, it's not the principles are very similar, but actually practically in organization, they are very, they are very different. Mm -hmm. Anyone wants to add anything to that? I would also add that they work in different uh, racial imageries. I mean, the US and the UK are not the same. That's a problem that we have that people sometimes talk about the US and the UK as if they are a, an extension of each other. And I think that is a mistake. They have been obviously very different racial project connected and interconnected in terms of racism and anti-racism, but they are very distinct. I think one thing that of course unites not only the US and the UK, but other places in, in Latin America, in other parts of the world has to do with some of the key issues that BLM is raising, and particularly we can just start with police brutality. And that is something that, you know, it helps, you know, mobilize and certain issues that are really key uh, 
for any discussion on institutional racism, structural racism, and and what is happening around the world and where how people of color are being treated, you know, particularly black people, how pe black people are being treated. Yes, there's another very interesting uh, question. And, and I suppose, you know, we could even generalize this question because the question is, is there a country slash society where white supremacy does not have a hold anymore? And um, I mean, are there societies that, uh, you know, would actually be a beacon? I mean, you guys obviously don't seem to have much faith in the report that was released today. So, you know, are there are there beacons? Pragya? Um, I would say that white supremacy exists in one form or the other everywhere because that's how our society has structured. That's the history, the legacy of imperialism, colonialism, slavery. So even in coming from South Asia, for instance, um, from an Indian context, I say white supremacy exists still in the notion of colorism there because this proximity to whiteness is still considered better for people. It's still people are assigned a higher status in society if they're fair skinned, if they're white skin, and it's a deeply rooted problem in society. Um, so even in, um, even in, countries where whiteness is not the de dominant demographic, predominant demographic, it's still, it's still that legacy has been left behind um, in the way that the, the, what we read, what we see, it's all shaped by white supremacy, I think. So, so are, there, are there any societies, countries that are in a better place that one can look up to? Or is it the same all over? A North Pole, maybe? I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I, I think I would go with this idea of white supremacy. Charles Mills has this great quote of white supremacy as the unnamed political system that has made the modern world what it is today. So, you know, it's impossible to talk about anywhere being beyond white supremacy because the whole point is that it captures the entire world system, right? Um, so you can't think about, I don't know, Uyghur concentration camps in China without thinking about how the very discourse of Islamophobia itself is rooted in that Western tradition of modernity. You can't think about um, Hindutva in, in India without thinking about how, you know, the very reification of the caste system was really bolstered by um, British uh, colonialists, right? You can't think about how Bolsonaro's project in Brazil is manufactured without thinking about how he wants to present this picture of Portugal um, as this amazing beacon of knowledge where Brazil is the best creation of Portugal um, and all of those enslaved people came to Brazil not because of the Portuguese but because of uh, African people themselves right so all of these bring us back to um, white supremacy as this unnamed political system even in societies where white people are not necessarily the demographic majority. Right, right. So maybe, maybe you know, I mean, two of you have been talking about decolonization because we seem to be coming back to this uh, dominant transnational discourse that seems to be quite deeply rooted uh, all over. And um, and so, and, and and two of you at least, and and probably you know, I mean, the other two as well. Uh, but you know, you are co-chair of decolonizing society in uh, in your departments. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know how you are trying to do that. I think I let Ali start with that. Okay, Ali. So yes, so it's um, it, it, and it kind of relates to one of the questions someone asked. Someone asked a question about you know white perspectives on history or something, and it relates also to the report today, which basically suggested that decolonizing the curriculum involves just basically getting rid of white authors. The issue with decolonizing is to show how colonialism, imperialism, empire, the construction of race how they were all formative processes, essential processes in the making of the modern world, right? So the world would not look as it looks like now if it weren't for all of those things that happened and that continue to shape contemporary power relations. So my one kind of like, my one thought that I would share is that the issue is really about going beyond bifurcated understandings of histories towards connected understandings of histories, right? So if you think about British industrialization, because the report that came out today basically said, oh, we need to, you know, give a positive vision of Britain's past. Well, you know, if you think about British industrialization and how Britain became modern, um, uh, one of the kind of success stories is cotton and the cotton industry. But the majority of that cotton was taken from the labor of the enslaved in the US. And then the majority of that was then exported from Britain 
to the colonies, particularly to India, where they would plummet those markets, right? So you can't really think about British modernity and British industrialization without thinking about the links to enslavement and colonialism simultaneously. You can't think about the very existence, for example, of the Nazi party and uh, the Holocaust and Nazism and European fascism, which we are all taught about in schools, without thinking about how Hitler used um, the genocide of indigenous Americans, how he used British tactics uh, that they used in the Boer concentration camps, how he took tactics from the Spanish colonization of Latin America with shooting sprees and forced starvations. Um, you can't really understand the very logic of European fascism without understanding how itself was derivative of European colonialism. So what we're trying to do with decolonizing is to show how what we're trying to create is not um, removing bits of history and removing bits of our understanding of societies and histories, but really to improve them by forging these connections that exist and these connections that were absolutely necessary to the stuff that we do learn about, but that we learn about in incredibly bifurcated manners. Right. Um, there, is, there is also a question here. How do you balance how useful it is to take part in European enlightenment ideals in order for society to flourish with the anti-racist animosity towards it? Who wants to have a go? Sorry, what was the question again? So it's in the chat. Um, how do you how okay. do you balance? how useful it is to take part in European enlightenment ideals in order for society to flourish with the anti-racist animosity towards it. So that's pretty, that's pretty easy. You just abandon, abandon the, the ridiculous conception that European enlightenment ideals are necessary for society to function and we can move on from there, I think. Right. Okay, <laughs> that's easily done. Now there's another question about the term BAME. Right? Where do you guys stand on that? Because this is also something that the report brings up and they want to completely, you know, outlaw the use of, uh, of this term. Um, so I suppose I've said a lot about the, these terms that we use and how that homogenizes people and how that centers whiteness and basically it's saying there's white and there's non-white. So again, you, you're kind of lumping everybody who's not considered white in, in one group and not disaggregating the data to show that actually within these communities, there's diversity, within these communities, there's different barriers to, uh, to and different kinds of oppression, different histories, different legacies. And, and, and I think that term has been used to kind of tokenize diversity in a lot of organizations because just by saying, oh, we've got 25% BME, and so we can tick that box that we've got diversity, but that might mean that within these, within that BME date, uh, this this label, the different communities there is there might not be much diversity. So we're not really considering that different communities face different levels of oppression and barriers and discriminate discrimination. So I think in that way, it's a really useful thing to talk about that these terms are really harmful. So any terms like that, um, people of color or BIPOC that's used in the USA, most of these terms are homogenizing people. And what we need is to disaggregate data. What we need is to individuate people as much as possible. But we do need some term because by some what can happen and what might happen with the, this government is that by just by removing the term altogether, the the even the issues related to the term can be erased as well. So that is something that we need to be careful about whether by removing the term, what, what are we hoping to achieve? What is this government going to do next if this term is being removed? Is it going to erase people's experience, lived experience? Is it going to erase the issues, the barriers that people face because of being belonging to a cohort like that or being in the minority. So I think we need to examine these terms, but we need to disaggregate the data as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pragya. Yes, a quick, quick word because we are less than a minute away, Monica. Yeah, well, I would say that we need to move away from identity-based uh, understandings to processes, you know, to, to think about oppression, to think about racism, to think about injustice, inequality, rather than you know, the naming of the of the identities. Therefore, that we can do better work at understanding what's going on for whom. That's thank you, I mean. thank you very much. So, so let me thank you all. Um, I think your verdict is very clear uh, on, on 
uh, whether anything has changed or not as a result of BLM so far. Uh, but I do see some hope um, that, okay, this is just a counter mobilization. This is just a backlash and the movement will just have to up its game and there will need to be cross-national action uh, across countries. And with this report out, I think, you know, this conversation in this movement is likely to continue for a while. So thank you very much, everyone, again. And, uh, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye.